Hey guys! With the 100th episode of Adam's Quest just around the corner, I knew that I wanted to do something special to celebrate this event. Something that I've wanted to do for a really long time now is a video that covers the lore that we've built around our tribes. Our gods and our goddesses, all of the important creatures that have made it to our history books over the literal years that we've been playing this game. You guys have been requesting a video like this for a long time too, and I think it'll be super fun to look back on the origins of some of our oldest deities. Maybe see how they've shaped our current tribe's ways? I hope that it'll help any newcomers to the series who might not be familiar with them, and it might serve as a refresher for those of you who have been around since the very beginning. Naturally, we would want to start off with Animeem. Animeem is the original deity, the very first creature worthy enough to ascend to such a rank in our lore. She's the goddess of war, and in our current tribe, she's known for challenging our leaders with hordes of hostile Beryinas, just as a test of their strength. This practice likely stems from her own life, as she was known as the protector of her tribe. As the only creature with a claw to her name, she was their sole defense against the carnivores in the dark, and would put herself on the line if it meant her family would be safe. With her crown of ram horns and her striking panda patterns, Animeem stood out from the moment she was born. Something that I feel is often forgotten about her is that she was born with both a claw and a no paw. She's usually portrayed as having two claws, but she wasn't without her flaws. I like to leave that open to interpretation though. Maybe she was gifted her second claw when she was given a new title, so she might rule over the skies with her supernatural strength. Animeem was born in one of the earliest versions of the game. In fact, her tribe was the very first one that I ever played on YouTube. Because of that, the game has gone under so many changes that by modern standards, she would actually be considered pretty weak. I've had a few people ask me why she's still considered to be the goddess of war when so many other creatures could outdo her, but I think her rank comes more from her selfless actions and her willingness to jump into battle. She judges our tribe mates just the same. She favors loyalty. Those who shun their families are cursed, and those who betray them are ruined. A creature who has received Animeem's blessing will doubtlessly wear her ram horns, though the true connection to the goddess of war must be her panda patterns. Though she's visited us many times since her tribe's disappearance, our current tribes have yet to meet her. Maybe someday they'll unlock the mysteries of the mask, but for now she remains an elusive force. Animeem never truly passed away. Another downside to playing the game so early was the occasional destruction of save files, and before her story was over, her tribe was unfortunately lost. So we'll never know truly how her story ended, but it's clear her spirit follows wherever our tribe goes. Our next deity is Vankir, the god of the harvest. While Vankir was technically the third deity born, he's what I would consider to be an opposing figure to Animeem, just her opposite in every way. Where she is a figure of strength, the Vankir is soft and gluttonous. His rains feed the tribe, growing berries aplenty on every bush, but a drought is the easiest way to tell that you've gotten on his bad side. The only way to appease him is an offering of more food. He might sound greedy, but his love for berries may have just saved his tribe. Vankir was born in the tribe of the tides, in a time where the nimble fingers were a mere myth. Very few had mastered the delicate art of berry collecting, as most wore Animeem's claws. That cut down their resources significantly, rendering most berry bushes useless to their cause. No matter how hard they tried, it seemed like they would never gather enough berries to keep their babies fed. And then Vankir was born. With a cracker jaw and two berry paws, the little striped baby was easily named the ultimate collector, and went on to father a whole family of harvesters far on a distant shore. He was known for taking on many mates in his time, all living together in a community, and raising their young like a lion pride together in the safety of their home. Those who follow his ways often share the same ideals, as the bigger the family, the greater the harvest will be. Vankir is a quiet god, but he's always about. He watches over every last berry on the island, and those who take his harvest for granted will quickly meet starvation. Next is Splash, the Son of the Sea. Splash was also born in the Tribe of the Tides, though much earlier than Vankir. In a time where gills and water bodies were a new concept to our creatures, who had never even set foot in the ocean before, Splash's birth caused quite the stir. His mutation was completely random. Chance was the only way to obtain the gills at the time, and it made him the very first to experience the ocean firsthand. Unfortunately, he did have one major flaw, 
His snow paws. Both of his paws were crippled. Although it made him look pretty cute, like tiny little flippers or little T-Rex arms, it made it very hard for him to get around on land. The water wasn't much better. He was known for being a pretty clumsy swimmer too, but it was where he felt most comfortable and where he made his fishy friends. Maybe the fish knew that he was harmless to them without claws to snatch them from the tides, and they often swam in circles around him while he played. Splash is a playful deity and rarely brings harm to our tribes. His presence instead ensures a safe passage through the ocean, as Splash's blessing grants a creature their ability to breathe in water. To attract his attention, many pairs have tracked down sea algae to build their nests with, with varying results. Maybe he's too distracted by his fish to take notice. After Splash, the Balance sisters were born on the Fernley Islands. Their names were Seafoam and Quicksand. Though the two were not twins, they may as well have been with how close they were to each other. They were born one day apart in a nursery on an island to a mother who shared Splash's unfortunate no-paw dilemma. But luck was on their side, they were healthy as could be, and would go on to travel the island side by side. The sisters were clear opposites of each other in appearance, which was what eventually gave them their title. Seafoam's fur was white like the crest of a wave, and she inherited her father's nimble fingers. Meanwhile, Quicksand's fur was an earthy brown, and her claw allowed her to keep her sister safe. Quicksand was known for being a hasty sort, often leaping before thinking, and it was Seafoam's job to pull her out of trouble before she ended up getting too hurt. They might have survived alone, but together, they balanced each other out, making up for each other's flaws. Because they spent so much time by the water, with Seafoam collecting shells and Quicksand searching for fish, it's often said that the shells on the shore are gifts from the Balanced Sisters. A baby blessed by the duo is born with both the claw and the nimble fingers, and generally they're considered to be pretty level-headed, like a perfectly balanced scale. The Balanced Sisters were inseparable even in death. Quicksand's brash nature landed her in a few sticky situations, allowing them to pass on the very same day together right at the waterside. If the Balance Sisters represent harmony, the Bandit Brothers are the embodiment of chaos. Born quite fittingly on the Harmony Islands, the twins were troublemakers from the very start. A glitch in the game caused the two to switch mask patterns each time their file was reloaded, making it extra hard to tell them apart. Even their portraits were mixed up, as if the two switched places on a regular basis for fun. It was said that Roducro and Kuvan would use mud and dirt to paint each other's markings until not even their own parents knew which one was which. When the tribe arrived on a giant island full of various biomes, the Bandit Brothers branched away from the family to start their own adventure. Though neither of them had the cracking skill, it didn't affect their love for shells, or perhaps it was a love for stealing instead. They encountered many swarms of crabbits guarding shells along the shore, Though with a little bit of trickery, they were often successful in snatching them from under their feet. This was where the Bandit Brothers earned their name, but their conquest didn't stop there. Roducro and Kuvan discovered a place known as the Old Kingdom in their travels. The Old Kingdom was an abandoned base full of permanent nests just waiting to be claimed, and claim them they did. From then on, the bandits were known for taking over homes that weren't theirs, raiding others' resources to keep their families alive. Because of this, the bandits never learned to make their own nests, and relied solely on those already built around the island. The Bandit Brothers still influence many tribes today. Anyone with a bandit mask is said to share their mischievous ways, though some have taken it a step further and carried on their legacy through glitches. Quirk, a resident of Whale Island, was known as a master of illusions when he tricked his tribe into thinking he had a scorpion tail instead of a tail fin. The Bandit Brothers would be proud. Of course, they do like to irritate the Balance Sisters and mess with their plans whenever possible. When one of their shells is stolen by the tides, we consider it to be one of their pranks. That tantalizing shell in the middle of the ocean might just be a trap, and never trust the Kravitz. They're still seeking the revenge. Comet's story is a sad one, ending in a selfless deed that would soon name him the God of Sacrifice. Comet was born on the Fernleaf Islands deep within the jungle, when the apes were still a frightening mystery to many in our tribes. When he and his family were discovered by a hearing ape, Comet did the only thing he could. He led the ape away, giving the tribe time to escape, but dooming himself to a very unfortunate fate. Hopping on a pair of frog toes, the thick weeds of the jungle made it impossible to skitter beyond the ape's reach. 
Just as he lured the foe toward the opposite shore, he met his end with one final blow. Though few know of his heroic sacrifice, without Comet's aid, the tribes and Earthrays would have likely been destroyed. The gods took pity upon him and soon welcomed him into their folds. Comet is another quiet deity, rising only when our tribe encounters jungles, if just to warn them about the danger that he knows so well. Sometimes brave souls will feel Comet's pull, like whispers alluring them toward the big jungle trees. This was how Adam's tribe discovered the jungle safe havens, which are oak trees that offer food and shelter in an otherwise hectic environment. This tradition lives on even today. The tribe always seeks the oak trees first, trusting that they'll be a safe place to raise their babies. Adam's quest has seen the rise of a few important deities too, the first among them, Munai and Crescent. Munai was known in her time as the Angel of Death. Knowing when somebody's time was drawing to a close, she would gravitate toward them, providing company as they drifted off to their next life. Her presence could be seen as a bad omen to somebody who wasn't ready to pass away, but those who stood by her knew true peace. Sometimes she would act as the gateway between life and death, carrying messages to the tribe from their ancestors but her fascination with death in general left her motherly instincts lacking, and she had trouble connecting with those who were very young. Her brother, Crescent, shared her mask and powers, yet he was known as the bringer of life. If Moon Eye's arrival brought a hush to the crowd, Crescent's instead was celebrated. He was drawn toward the birth of new life and spent much of his time visiting the nurseries. It was considered good luck to have Crescent nearby when a baby was born. Together, Munai and Crescent represent the cycle of rebirth in our tribe. Munai guides souls to the afterlife, and Crescent pulls them back, so when a spirit is reborn, both of their roles are at play. Their ways have influenced many of our current families. The shamans and the gravediggers of Adam's Quest all originate from Munai and Crescent, and their jobs ensure that the cycle of rebirth remains as strong as ever. Then there's Melody, the Herald of Flames. Melody was born in the burning savanna, a hopelessly hot land, so hot that wildfires could bloom without warning, swallowing anyone foolish enough to stand in their way. Her bright white fur stood out like a beacon in the savanna grasses, and her water body was an unfortunate twist of fate, for she would never touch the ocean in her lifetime. The abyss is no friend to Splash's followers. Melody's piercing red eyes, like twin flames, unnerved many who crossed her, which eventually sealed her fate. Her tribe mates began to believe that she brought the fires to them, for they sprouted wherever she roamed. So they ousted her, throwing her out into the wilderness to fend for herself alone. Melody became an outcast, finding love only in those who had been banished like her. Like Anamim, she looks for loyalty when sending out her blessing. Those who betray their family aren't worth her time. The heat body is considered a gift from the Herald of Flames, and the inhabitants of the mountain revere her for this. Where her fires brought death in the savannas, they bring life in the winter's cold, and without her favor, our ancient legends would struggle to survive. The final deity is the newest, Solaris, the messenger of the gods, born after his tribe's conquest of Whale Island. While the wings had been discovered prior to his birth, Solaris was the first child born with a full set. He was the only creature who could truly take to the skies, and he made the best of it. He swooped from tree to tree, visiting various communities along the island they called home, and carrying messages back and forth when needed. He was a collector of trinkets too, sampling the unique flora of each new biome that he found. Sometimes he would return to his personal love with a special gift from a faraway land, which eventually won him her heart. Solaris was invested in the youth of the tribe and opened up his own school for flight. It was a class that helped each winged creature born after find their bearings in the sky. Though he may have simply been named the God of Flight, such a title seemed too plain for Solaris. He prefers instead to ferry offerings to his fellow deities, helping our tribe get their message across. To snag Solaris' attention, one simply needs to find him a special trinket, a unique shell or a colorful plant to add to his collection. Consider it payment for his troubles. Though these are the creatures that I would consider to be our core group of deities, there are countless others who have left their mark and continue to tell their stories. Takira, the pattern painter, who was born on Harmony Islands. He paints the markings on our new babies to feed his artistic spirit. 
Mulberry is suffering from a self-proclaimed curse that burdened his family with bad luck. He guides the bugs of the swamplands today, infecting those vulnerable to his aura. And Diamond, a creature of good fortune? His presence might help guide the sick toward those hidden healing fruits. I'm sure there are plenty more that we could mention, as our lore has been crafted over years of playing this game. So if there's someone you think that we should remember, feel free to mention them in the comments. Whose story was your favorite? So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It's been a lot of fun to go back and reminisce on these old tribes of ours, and I hope this helps explain where all of our deities come from. It makes me really excited to continue our story, and I can't wait to see what creatures rise to the ranks next. I hope you guys are looking forward to the 100th episode of Adam's Quest 2. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye guys!